All right, so welcome. So we are going to be today um, having a webinar on brain surgery and epilepsy. And so we, um, today, a couple housekeeping things that I want to get started with before we dive into the topic. Um, it's an hour long and just want to mention some bandwidth capabilities. So if you have other apps running in the background that might um, slow down your connection and or if you have other family members that might be using um, other um, internet users in the house like Netflix, just to be aware of things like that. Um, there is a certificate of attendance that we'll be sharing after. Um, and so I'll be sending a follow up email with that. And this is going to be recorded today, so it'll be available after today. And so I just want to mention that as well. I want to mention too that um, you might have some questions and we would love to hear from you. And so I'm going to ask you to use your Q&A feature. So if you scroll over the top, you'll see that there's an option where it says Q&A. And in that spot, you are able to send a message. Um, Dr. White will be addressing some of your questions um, at the end. We may get to some of them before, but um, it's a great way to make sure that we're um, seeing those questions and are aware of them. So please feel free to, um, as you're thinking about things and have questions at any point, you can put it in there. You don't have to wait for the end to share your questions. And I'm Lisa Peterson. I'm the Regional Outreach Manager in Northern Minnesota at the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. And that is my contact information. And I am thrilled to be here with you this evening. And I wanna share a disclaimer. So while the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota is hosting this webinar, all the content and discussion points are led and delivered today by Dr. James White from the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. The information shared is to inform you of all the aspects of available brain surgery options. However, all potential treatment options should be discussed with your medical provider. And today's objectives are to have an increased knowledge of surgical options as treatment um, option for epilepsy. And so you'll have an improved awareness of treatment options beyond medication, and you'll have gained awareness and understanding of key differences between lobectomy, laser ablation, RNS, VNS, and DBS. And today's topic, again, although it's on brain surgery as a treatment option for epilepsy, I want to just bring into focus um, the very basic um, you know, definition of what epilepsy is. So epilepsy is a neurological condition. So it happens in the brain when someone has unprovoked recurring seizures. So not just a single event, but there's something happening in the brain causing there to be um, continued um, seizure activity. So that is the condition that we're discussing today and why brain surgery might be an option for some individuals. You may also hear it referred to as seizure disorder or seizure condition. So we just want to make sure that on a very basic level that we address um, what epilepsy is. Um, we don't want to assume that everyone attending today um, always knows um, some of those other pieces that help to understand what we'll be talking about. And I'm going to start with a poll question. So this is a way that we're able to hear from you. We wanna know a little bit about who you are today. So I'm going to um, start up with our first poll question. And so in just a moment here, um, all right. So you will see the first question and it asks, what is your relationship to epilepsy? And if you have more than one relationship, you can select more than one on this poll. So go ahead and you can answer on your side. And then when I see that everyone has answered, I'll end the poll and then you'll all be able to see the results. Gives us a little bit of, of an idea of who is with us today. So again, if you would take a moment here, I'm gonna give you just a couple more seconds. We have a little, another one that we're waiting for. All right, and at this time, I'm going to go ahead and share the results with you. So you can see that um, some of the people here today have epilepsy, some have family members or a child or a spouse, and some work with someone 
who have had epile- who have epilepsy. So it gives us an idea that there are people here today for different reasons who have different connections to epilepsy. Really interesting, isn't it? Uh, these polls are really helpful to get a sense of who's uh, who's watching. This is great. Absolutely. So now I am going to, I have one other poll that I want to do with you right away. And so if you would watch for your polls, again, I'm going to um, share that with you. So the second question that you'll see now is which best describes you? So we also want to know a little bit about your connection to brain surgery. So if you've had brain surgery or if you know someone or if you're thinking about it for yourself or someone else, or you're just here today because you want to learn more. Maybe it's something that you have an interest in, have an interest in, but it doesn't um, affect you or your family directly. So this gives us a little bit of an idea of who our audience is that is in the room with us tonight. So thank you again for answering. I'll give you just another moment here as I see some of the answers are still coming in. Wonderful. It looks like everyone's had a chance to answer. And again, you can see there's a wide variety of answers that we received. So there are people here today who have already gone through having brain surgery and some that are considering it or here to learn about it, or you might know someone. So again, there are um, just a wide variety of experiences that people come here with today. So thank you for helping us get a little bit of a feel um, for what your prior experiences are. Oh, it definitely helps. These polls are great. And I, now I want to um, take a moment and share with you, I have the honor of presenting Dr. James White. Um, Dr. White and I, um, we've known each other for a long time. Um, in fact, Dr. White was my epileptologist. Um, I had brain surgery in 2002 and um, Dr. White was a huge part of that process for me. And so it's my honor and privilege to be able to introduce him to you tonight. Um, he has a specialty in neurology, epilepsy, and seizures. His certification um, is with the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Um, he did his undergraduate school at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, and his medical school at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Minneapolis. He did his internship at St. Luke's Hospital in Chesterfield, Missouri, his residency in neurology at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, he did his fellowship with epilepsy clinical neurophysiology at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And the professional organizations that he is affiliated with are the American Academy of Neurology and the American Epilepsy Society. He has medical licenses in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and North Dakota. And his interests are in optimizing the diagnosis and treatment of patients with seizure disorders, patient education, improving the side effect profile of seizure medications, and epilepsy surgeries. So without further ado, I am going to pass it off to Dr. White, who I am, again, thrilled to have here tonight to share his expertise with us. Thank you, Lisa. What a what a nice introduction. And I, I just want to say that the work that uh, you do, Lisa, and uh, Minnesota or Minnesota Epilepsy Foundation, just really inspiring work. So thank you. Uh, it's a great opportunity to talk. Uh, the topic we will be going over is epilepsy surgery: exciting new options for patients. Uh, next slide. I have on the first slide. I I really. I, I put a lot of different surgical options on this slide. So this slide has a lot on it, but I also wanted to send the message that there's a lot of new surgical options out there. So just to kind of read them off, there's responsive neurostimulation, so RNS. There's deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, so DBS. There's vagal nerve stimulator for epilepsy, VNS. And finally, laser ablation. And so during this talk, we'll be going over some of these, these options. And they're really, really what they do, they open up 
more possibilities for patients for the treatment of their epilepsy. So I hope that at the end of this talk, people come away with the idea that epilepsy surgery is really advancing. There's a lot of exciting options out there. And uh, hopefully we can answer some of the patient's uh, questions that we saw in that poll, because we'll try to try to really address them the best that we can here. Uh, so, uh, so really just more treatment options for patients. Uh, next slide. So the outline, we'll go over who should have epilepsy surgery, because that's one of the most common questions I get in my clinic. Uh, what, what does the surgery evaluation evolve, involve? So I'll go through that in, in detail. And we'll cover some of the more common surgeries. This is not the a full listing of all the surgical options out there, but just some of the ones that are, are newer or most promising for patients in terms of having a really good impact on their quality of life. So temporal lobe surgery, that's where we would have the surgeon go in and remove a small piece of brain tissue. So that's the temporal lobe surgery. Responsive neurostimulation, deep brain stimulator, vagus nerve stimulator, and laser ablation. So we'll go over these uh, in detail. I know a lot of people uh, who, are, who are online here tonight, they've heard of these. And when, when I'm talking to patients in clinic, a lot of times they've heard of, the, uh, of these options, but they really want more detail. And so we will often do patient education in our clinic where we'll go through these in detail. And that's the, that's the goal tonight. Next slide. So I thought I'd start with a patient example. And this is a 29-year-old female with a long history of seizures. Her seizures began when she was three years of age. And the, uh, the, the seizure activity started with a fever. And she did, she did fine after that fever-related seizure. And she didn't have any further seizures until age 16 when she started having her seizures that were unprovoked, just out of the blue. And they unfortunately became regular seizures. And the seizure characteristics, what she would do with her seizures is she would stare, become unresponsive, she would pick at her clothes. I don't know how much people can see me on the, on the video here, but she'd kind of pick at her clothes. Uh, the seizures would last for uh, about two minutes. Uh, she'd also kind of smack her lips. Uh, I don't know if people have seen that with seizures, but the lips would kind of smack, pick at the clothes. Her family would ask her questions. And uh, one thing people would say, you know, the, the lights were on, but no one was home, that she just would not respond, just kind of out of it. Rarely she would go into a full grand mal seizure. So she would stiffen up, arms would stiffen up. She would collapse to the floor uh, and have a full body uh, jerking type seizure. And so those were fortunately the grand mal or generalized tonic clonic seizures were not as common as the uh, milder staring seizures. But unfortunately the seizures were still occurring two to three times uh, per month. Next slide. She had no other significant medical problems, very healthy except for her seizures. She was taking carbamazepine, levetiracetam, and lamotrigine. And despite multiple seizure medications, her seizures seemed to be getting more frequent and more intense. She was working as a cashier and Unfortunately, the, the seizures were making her job and her quality of life just much more difficult. And I, I, I think people who are, who are watching this here today, they, they understand she had trouble with transportation. She was, she was a patient who, who for some periods of her life, she, she had good enough control where she was just about to get her license and then bam, she'd get hit with this seizure. So that was frustrating. Uh, she also had some difficulty with jobs where the, her, her employer would just make things kind of difficult for her on the job. She seemed to lose jobs in part because of her seizures. And really the, the seizures were having more and more impact on her, on her quality of life, especially as they became more frequent and more intense. Next slide. So she was referred to our group for evaluation in part because her seizures were just not controlled with the medications. And so 
as as part of our routine, and and and, and most epilepsy centers would do this in a very similar way. First, you meet the patient, and you do a very detailed history and physical exam. So details on seizures can give clues as to where in the brain the seizures are coming from. So if you remember the story that she gave as to what her seizure characteristics were like with that staring, unresponsiveness, lip smacking, picking at the clothes, those are all clues that her seizures may be coming from the temporal lobe. Meanwhile, people tell you that their seizures are, one side of the body starts to jerk, uh, that can suggest that the seizures may be coming from the other side of the brain in the motor cortex. So the seizure details are really critical. So you really have to take a lot of time to get a very detailed history. There's a team approach in somebody who is being considered for epilepsy surgery. And so the patient will often see the epileptologist, of course. And so that's the neurologist with the subspecialty training in epilepsy. They'll meet our EEG techs. Uh, they're great. You know, they'll they'll get they'll hook the patient up to the EEG, and a lot of times we'll do an outpatient EEG as well as an inpatient EEG, and that'll help us figure out where in the brain seizures could be coming from. Nursing staff is critical for that comprehensive care. The neuropsychologists will also be involved. The neuropsychologist is the staff member who will do testing. You can imagine patients who have seizures, they very often will have cognitive strengths and then areas where they kind of drop down. So they may do really well on some of the tests. They really like some of the tests, doing great. And then the area where their seizures are coming from, a lot of times suddenly the patients don't think that test is so easy and they may show some uh, areas where they're just not as strong. So the neuropsychologist can help us tease that out. And it's really very helpful for knowing what the patient's cognitive strengths are, weaknesses, and that can allow us to figure out where in the brain the seizures are coming from. The psychologist is key. Patients who have, who have seizures, like the patient I described, she was having trouble on the work front, trouble with transportation. Uh, the psychologist and the social worker can help with, with, with these kinds of issues and it can just be so helpful. Uh, the, the patients who have uh, seizures can have anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression are common in society and certainly patients who are on seizure medications, having seizures, they certainly can have issues with that. And so the psychologist can really help. So my, my point of this slide is there's a team approach for somebody who's being considered for epilepsy surgery. Next slide, please. Now, the, the patient that I am uh, discussing, she was admitted to the hospital for inpatient video EEG monitoring. So what that would involve is she's admitted and she's in the hospital. Usually they're in the hospital for several days. So probably about five days would be a pretty typical uh, length of stay. And the goal is to record the seizures and figure out where in the brain the seizures are coming from. Because of course, if you're going to consider epilepsy surgery, you wanna pinpoint the seizures where in the brain they are as precisely as possible. So this patient, she was admitted, uh, a, a common practice is to lower the seizure medications. Because you know, if you're only having three seizures a month and you don't lower the seizure medication, you may not get the seizures during that four or five days in the hospital. And so what we did is we lowered her seizure medications and then she gave us multiple seizures. And uh, the you can kind of see, Lisa maybe you can point to the EEG uh, uh, part and you can kind of see where her seizures, can you kind of just kind of give an idea of where those spikes are? And you can kind of see all those spikes coming from the area of her, of her brain where her seizures are coming from. And that gave us clues as to where a seizure is coming from. So we, we recorded, ideally we like to record, you know, two to three seizures if possible, sometimes even more. And what we do is we look for a consistent pattern of where in the brain the seizures are coming from. So the patient's on video. So remember the video is very helpful for the characteristics. 
and the EEG also helps pinpoint things. Next slide. Patient also had a state-of-the-art MRI. And Lisa, can you point to that area in the temporal lobe? So this is on the left, maybe on the left-hand one, right there, exactly there. Leave it where that white area is. That's where some scarring was. So the MRI picked up a little bit of scarring in her left temporal area. And that was really, really helpful uh, to help us figure out that her seizures may be coming from that area. The slides on the right were something called a magnetic source imaging. And I'll talk about that a little bit, a uh, little bit down the road here in the talk, but you can kind of see where that yellow is. You can see where clusters of, of magnetic signal abnormality is, which is another clue as to where seizures are coming from. Next slide. So the patient that I'm presenting, her seizure description is consistent with temporal lobe seizures, EEG with showed seizure activity coming from the left temporal area, and both the MRI and that MSI or magnetic source imaging show the left temporal abnormalities. So everything was lining up in the area of that left temporal lobe. So Lisa, if you could point again just to that left temporal lobe. And uh, the, uh, yeah, perfect. And so that's the area, that's the target of where we think the seizures were coming from. And so, uh, next slide. What we did is we got together and we talked about our case during our surgery conference. So we have, when I say surgery conference, the, the conference is, is packed with people who have a long, uh, a long history of working with patients with epilepsy being considered for surgery. So the room includes that list that I gave you of, of, the, of the key people involved. It includes the epileptologist, uh, uh, nursing staff, EEG staff, neuropsychology, psychology, social work. Uh, in addition, we have neuroradiology as well. And, they, and we all discuss the cases. Oh, I should say you know, neurosurgery is there uh, and, and just all the, all the key people who will be helpful for figuring out what the best treatment option is for, for a patient. And so this patient, we agreed as a group that she would benefit from a left temporal lobectomy. So you can see in that red circle, you can see where that part of the brain was removed. Now this, this slide makes it look like there's a, a very large piece of the temporal lobe removed. Usually what we do is uh, it, it, it looks larger because of uh, how the cut is, but it, we don't remove the entire temporal lobe. Usually just kind of the, the front part of the temporal lobe uh, is removed during the surgery because that's often where the, where the seizures are coming from. And so our patient did great. She was ended up being tapered off of her, her seizure medications. She's driving, and most importantly, even more important than the seizures themselves, her overall big picture quality of life was better. So her life was much better. So she really had a great, uh, really a great outcome. Next slide. So who should, who should consider uh, epilepsy surgery? So patients who have tried two or more seizure medications and they continue to have seizures uh, should be evaluated for, for epilepsy surgery. And so this is the, this is the opinion of the, the American Epilepsy Society, as well as the American Academy of Neurology. Now people, uh, one, one of the reasons I really uh, am so pre appreciative of Lisa and the Minnesota uh, uh, Epilepsy uh, Foundation, I, I just, the, it's really just uh, the chance to get out and talk about some of the benefits of epilepsy surgery. Because too often people look at epilepsy surgery as very much a last resort. And really, once you've tried two or more seizure medications, you really should think about, uh, uh, really think about uh, epilepsy surgery. And as I say, this is the opinion of, of some of our biggest societies. Next slide. So 
what happens to patients with new onset epilepsy? Why do we say two seizure medications? If, you don't, if you're not successful with two seizure medications, you should think about epilepsy surgery. And one of the reasons for that is if you try three seizure medications, four seizure medications, you're not likely to get complete seizure control. And here's the, here's the proof. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the percentage of patients who are controlled with their first uh, seizure medications. So if somebody comes to me and they have newly diagnosed seizures, they just had maybe one or two seizures in their life. When I put them on a seizure medication, I have about a 47% chance of completely controlling their seizures. Meanwhile, so 47% are controlled, but remember about 53% or so are still having seizures. So if you add a second seizure medication, you're gonna improve your odds by about 13%. So the first two seizure medications, you can make some progress, but if you add a third seizure medication, fourth, fifth, you're just not going to get the seizure control that the patient may want. So if you, if you want seizure freedom, and oftentimes that's what the, what the goal is, then you, uh, you may want to consider epilepsy surgery if you have tried two or more seizure medications. So I think that's one of the reasons in the past, perhaps epilepsy surgery was more of a, of a last resort, but now with, with the technology, with all the advantages, the safety improvements, it really is much more uh, sooner uh, after you've tried a few different uh, seizure medications. So again, when it comes to uh, those who are controlled versus not controlled, there's about 64% of patients with epilepsy that are completely controlled with seizure medications, and then about 36% who are not controlled. And it's that 36% who you really wanna think about, hey, maybe that's the group we should think about epilepsy surgery for. Next slide. So patients with temporal lobe epilepsy can have great outcome. The chance of seizure freedom can be 60 or 70% in terms of having complete seizure freedom. Realize, I don't think there's any patients we can give that 100% uh, recommendation. I have had patients tell me that if I can't give them 100% guarantee for a uh, complete seizure freedom, then they don't want the surgery. And I, I just had to say, we can't do that. We can't give you 100%, but we can give you a significant percent chance of being seizure-free for many of our surgeries, or at least have a dramatic reduction in the seizures. So th those are some of the some of the some of the percentages. Uh, you need to carefully weigh the risks and benefits. The, the the surgeries can have great benefit for your quality of life, but there's always risk. So risks can be serious, although they're very low percent chance that's gonna to happen to an individual patient. Uh, the risk includes stroke, infection, and memory decline. And that's what patients always ask me about, and that's what we go through in detail. Now, usually the benefits outweigh the risks, uh, but it's always tailored to the patient. The patient, some patients may have more risk for their memory or more risk to have stroke, and those we do a lot of the kind of weighing the, the risks and the benefits uh, to try to get them uh, the best outcome uh, possible. And again, when we when we talk about epilepsy surgery in the clinic, we try to do a very good job of giving a balanced review. We talk about the good things that can happen with surgery and also the also the risks. All right, next slide. So I, I'm pretty close to having covered the pre-surgical evaluation, but just to kind of summarize, detailed history inpatient video EEG monitoring, neuropsychological testing, MRI of the brain. I think most people have had an MRI, but a lot of people who are, who are attending here this evening have had MRI of the brain. So you know what that's all about. That's a detailed picture of your brain. Remember, MRI scans are getting more sophisticated with time. And so if you haven't had an MRI for a while, uh, it may be beneficial to consider that if you're considering epilepsy surgery uh, because of the advances. The magnetic source imaging, so that MSI, if you look on the right, so Lisa, if you could look at that cluster of yellow, uh, yellow triangles there. So the MSI, it, you can see that nice patient with her 
with her head uh, in the uh, magnetic source imaging machine right next to her. Uh, that's Dr. Zhang, who I, who I work with at the uh, Minnesota Epilepsy Group. Uh, and he, he does a great job, reads the scans, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it gives us that image. You can imagine if you have clusters of magnetic signal abnormality that correlates with where the seizures are coming from. So very advanced uh, technology. PET scan is another imaging which is very advanced where glucose can be injected into your bloodstream. So glucose is then taken up by the brain and the area where the seizures are coming from may have low glucose uptake. uptake. So the remainder of the brain will have normal glucose uptake but the area where the seizures are coming from may not have a normal amount of glucose. And it kind of will look a little bit uh, low glucose, kind of a cold spot. Again, that can kind of pinpoint, ah, the seizures are coming from, from that area. So those are some of the pre-surgical evaluation testing. Uh, so th this is kind of how we work a patient up. We, we go through all the testing. We present the patient at that surgery conference. I, I had talked about that earlier. That's where you have the whole team, epileptologist, neurosurgeon. Uh, you have psychology, neuropsychology, nursing, EEG, just a whole team there. And uh, we, we look at the, look at the patient uh, together uh, and we make decisions as to what the surg best surgical option would be. Uh, so before a patient has temporal lobectomy or other surgeries, we do that. We also do that before a patient will have a device placed. Uh, next slide. So that, that kind of uh, puts us into the next part of our talk where we're gonna talk about some of the devices uh, and other surgical uh, strategies for patients with, with epilepsy. So I'm gonna start by going over the RNS system for epilepsy. Uh, next slide. Let's, uh, let's talk about this slide. This is, this is the RNS system. And I wanna go through this in some detail because I wanna describe how the RNS works. Again, I think people who are tuning in tonight, they probably know RNS kind of works by sensing the seizures and, and, and zapping the brain with electricity and stopping the seizures. And that's, that's spot on, that's how it works. Let's go through it in some detail. Lisa, can you, can you point to the, the computer looking thing there? Uh, so right there, that's, that's the device. That's the RNS device. That's a little computer that is not in the brain or directly on the brain. It's actually inserted into the bone, into your skull. Now, Lisa, can you, can you point to those two little electrodes? Oh, this is perfect, thank you. Those two electrodes, those electrodes are in fact directly on the brain and they're right in the area where the seizure onset area is. And so that's, that's uh, the key is you need to have a good idea where the seizures are coming from. You put those electrodes right over where the seizures are coming from. Uh, and so imagine that those electrodes on the surface of the brain pick up that a seizure is occurring. What they do is they send that impulse to the computer the computer immediately reads the information and then sends within a literally a fraction of a second, they, it sends electricity to the brain to, to really give a, an electrical charge to the brain that stops the seizure. And that's how the RNS system works. So it's, it's responsive. It, it's not stimulating all day long. It's stimulating when the patient is having a seizure that the computer is, is reading as, okay, patient's in, having a seizure, let's try to stop that right away. So it can do it so fast that the patient does not get an aura, doesn't even realize that they've had a seizure. Next slide. So this is just a, a drawing of the RNS and you can see, uh, you can see the device so Lisa, if you could uh, just kind of uh, show people that where the device is. So that's again, that's in the, in the skull. And then if you could uh, point to the cortical strip, the, the cortical strip there, that's on the surface of the brain. And then you can see the, uh, the depth lead uh, and that's more kind of in the deeper part of the brain. So those are just some of the, some of the options uh, for the RNS. Next slide. So 
the uh, slide I'm showing here goes over how the RNS will reduce seizures. And what I want you to do is kind of look look at the uh, the graph. This is over years. If you look at the bottom part of the graph, you see year one, two, three, all the way up to year nine. And so those, uh, what this is, is how many years after the RNS was placed. And so it gives you the percent uh, median seizure reduction. So patients uh, year one will have about a 44% reduction in seizures. Pretty good. Having your seizures reduced by 44% is pretty good. But you can see that over time, things tend to just get better. And it's a very interesting fact of devices, but they can go, the uh, according to the, the long-term studies, up to 75% reduction in seizures, which is, which is pretty, pretty exciting. And so you can just see that things, things get better, better over time. Next slide. So, so while the, the, the benefits of the responsive neurostimulation is, is very impressive, I think, uh, you also have to consider the safety profile. And it is a very safe device. But like any time you're doing surgery, and I say this to my patients whenever we're talking about epilepsy surgery, the, the surgeon is going to be going into uh, the skull, into the brain uh, to place these. And so there's going to be some risk. There's going to be a risk of infection. There's going to be a risk of stroke. There's going to be a risk of a, a small bleed, perhaps. Uh, and so those are some of the risks you have to think about. Fortunately, the percentage for these risks is relatively low. And, uh, and even... So, so if you look at all infections uh, and all small little bleeds, uh, you know, those, those can certainly be seen, but the, the rate of uh, more permanent uh, complications uh, is fortunately very low. And so I think that that can be reassuring. Uh, so at the bottom of this slide, it says no persistent clinically significant neurologic sequela. I want to make people realize that was in the approval trials. Uh, now that the device has been out on the market longer, uh, there, are, there are some patients, fortunately rare, who've, who've suffered stroke and, and, and those kind of complications. So just be aware there's always risk with these surgeries, uh, but hopefully the benefits would outweigh them. Next slide. So, so what are the results uh, with the RNS system beyond seizures? So seizure control is really important, but they, they've done a lot of studies about how a patient's cognitive function is and how is their mental health and how is their overall quality of life? Because again, as an epilepsy doctor, I want to stop seizures, but that's only part of our job. Part of our job is also the, the overall quality of life. How is the patient doing? Uh, overall, and that's really, really important. So uh, in, in studies where they looked at how a patient was doing before the RNS versus after, uh, they, they tend to do much better uh, after, after the surgery. Next slide. Uh, so this just gives you a little bit of an idea about some of the um, options with the uh, uploading the data. So at least if you could point to that left-hand uh, slide, you can see how the, uh, the data is uploaded. And then the doctor, if you point to the right-hand slide, that's all the, what the doctor will be looking at in combination with the NeuroPACE team uh, to figure out uh, really what the best way to uh, you know, improve the patient's seizure control. Next slide. Uh, this just kind of goes over some of the trend lines. So a lot of, lot of data is generated by this RNS system and you can adjust things. Next slide. And it's really kind of a fingerprint. Each individual patient has their own seizure pattern and the RNS can be adjusted uh, to just give the patient the best, the best care possible. So it's not one size for everybody. It's rather uh, tailored to the patient's seizure uh, type. Next slide. So I'd like to move on to uh, DBS. So this is deep brain stimulation for epilepsy. Next slide. So, so what is this? This is a, a device which is placed under the skin in the chest 
and it has leads which will go into the brain, deep in the brain. That's why it's called deep brain stimulation. It goes deep in the brain to an area of the brain called the thalamus. And by giving electrical impulses to the, 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 the deep part of the brain, you can reduce the uh, frequency and severity of seizures. Next slide. This slide, I just, uh, uh, Lisa, can you can you point to the thalamus there? Kind of, uh, I want to direct people to the kind of middle of the slide, kind of looks like an almond, and there's the thalamus. I, I want to point that out because that is, you can see it's rather, rather deep in the brain is where those probes are placed. Uh, but the thalamus is a generator of seizure activity. So those probes go 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 deep into the brain in the thalamus. And by giving those uh, stimulations, you can improve seizure control. Next slide. So look at, look at the numbers. Numbers are very similar uh, to what we saw for uh, the RNS. So over seven years, this slide has seven years. And you can see similar to the RNS, uh, seizure control just improves over time. And for, so for year one, it's a 43% uh, of patients with a 50% or greater reduction in seizures. And by year seven, 74% of patients have a 50% or greater reduction in seizures. So again, very similar to the RNS. Next slide. So DBS has risks that are rather similar to the RNS. You might have uh, in implant site uh, pain, tingling sensation, uh, you might get an infection, and so those are some of the some of the risk. Again, it's 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 uh, the the risks of surgery are something that have to be discussed in detail uh, with your doctor. So as a patient, you can make the best decisions. Next slide. So notice some of the percentages. So uh, so uh, you know infection. Uh, really, I think. Uh, I think stroke is always a risk for, for epilepsy surgery. So these are just some of the, some of the numbers out there. Uh, notice when it says 10% infection, remember that's all infections. Most of those are very superficial, easily treated. It's relatively uncommon that the device would have to be removed. Next slide. Uh, so patients can have a programmer where they can kind of turn the therapy on and off. Next slide. And overall, patients tend to be satisfied with the VNS. Uh, so after five years, 75% of patients uh, recommend that they are, are, want to continue the, uh, uh, the DBS. Next slide. Let's say we have a poll question. Lisa, what do you think? Yep. So I am going to um, set us up for our next poll. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here again. At this time, you will see your third poll question. And the question is, what are your biggest concerns about brain surgery? And there um, is an opportunity to share more than one answer. So it's multiple choice. If you have various things that you're thinking about regarding your concerns about uh, brain surgery, you can select as many as you would like. So go ahead at this time and select your answers. I'll give everyone a couple seconds here. Again, this gives us a little bit of an idea of where you're at in your journey and what you're thinking about. And again, we know that people come here with a variety of experiences. Some of you have already walked through the journey of surgery. Others are thinking about it. And so this is helpful for us. Um, it looks like almost everyone has had a chance to respond. Oh, these are, these are some of the uh, most common questions I get in clinic for sure. All right, and I'm just going to wait another second here. It looks like we have one more person waiting to respond. All right. So you can see now, I'm going to share the results that, you know, and Dr. White, you can really speak to this about um, what you hear from patients as they come in and think about surgery and what their biggest concerns are. Um, what are your thoughts on what you see with um, where people are at and what their primary concerns are? I would say this is a really nice representation of 
what I see out in my in my clinic when I'm going over this because part of one of the things that we will often do is is set up an hour long uh, education for epilepsy surgery. So so just to kind of go over some of the details so the patients really well educated on the particular surgery that they're going to have. And we always cover both the benefits as well as the risks. And we talk about what are the patient's biggest concerns. And this is just, this really represents that uh, very, uh, very, very similar to what I see. It even kind of ranks it, you know, uh, you know, it just the, I think the continuing to have seizures and loss of memory are two of the bigger ones. And then the other thing is, you know, it is a big deal. Patients, uh, they, they often will have to have surgery where the surgeon's going into the brain. And so these are not small things, uh, they're not small procedures. And so the patient has very appropriate uh, concerns. Once they learn more about what the advances are in, in, in neurosurgery, they tend to be reassured, but they're, they're good questions for sure. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to you at this time. And so, um, we're going to continue on with Dr. White's presentation. And again, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So we're going to jump into the next segment here. Thank you. Good. So, so Lisa, we are now at about 647. So I'll try to finish. Uh, how many minutes for, for questions at the end? Do you think um, we five minutes? Leave a, yeah, I would say five to 10 at least. So I think what we'll try to do is try to be done with the presentation. I would say leaving about five to 10 minutes or whatever you can leave um, is perfect. Perfect. All right. So we're are, we're going to talk about two more topics, and the first topic we'll talk about is VNS. Next slide. So I just want to kind of go over what the VNS is about. So it's where a device is placed under your skin in your chest area, and then a nerve. It's attached to a nerve in your neck called the vagal nerve, and the that device in your chest will stimulate the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve then will have attachments to the brainstem uh, and then there are connections up into the cerebral cortex and that's how it works by sending electrical charge on a regular basis often for like 30 seconds on five minutes off it will uh, stimulate the nerve and uh, reduce the frequency and intensity of seizures next slide So yeah, we'll go, we'll go uh, next slide. Great. Uh, VNS has been around for quite a while, more than 25 years, the VNS has been available. I have, I have worked with the VNS for, for many years and I find it to be a very powerful tool to reduce seizure frequency. Uh, also, it's not as invasive as some of those other procedures. Uh, remember DBS and RNS, you have to go into the brain uh, and for the VNS, the advantage is it, it's, it's not as invasive. Next slide. The seizure reduction is, is typically quoted as about 60% reduction in seizures. And so it's a, it's a powerful tool. Also reduces the severity of seizures, which is very helpful. Next slide. And this just gives you an idea of some of the tools. Uh, you can see the device. Uh, the wand, at least maybe you can point to the wand. So the wand is what we uh, place over the device on the patient's chest, and then we can communicate with the tablet. So you can point to that tablet, uh, and that's where we do all the, all the programming of, of the parameters. Next slide. One of, the, one of the new things about the vagus nerve stimulator is the auto stimulation. And so as people who are uh, joining us here tonight, they, they know that when you have a seizure, oftentimes your heart rate will go up. And that's what the auto stimulation will do. It'll sense the heart rate going up and give the patient a stimulation and hopefully stop the seizure activity uh, kind of immediately. And so uh, again, this is one of the newer aspects of the vagus nerve stimulator. Even though the VNS has been around for a while, uh, this auto stimulation is relatively newer uh, and is a, is a nice advance for the VNS. Next slide. So I think the, uh, some of the things that, that the vagus nerve stimulator and other 
other devices will do is people uh, people who are who are here tonight they know that seizure medications can really affect your your cognitive function your energy make you feel like a zombie they have those toxic medication side effects vagus nerve stimulator and these other devices they don't have that they have some side effects, but they're they're not those medication side effects. So patients tend to become uh, even some some patients become more alert, uh, and so it's a real benefit. Also reduces the uh, the frequency of healthcare needs, so you don't go to the ICU or the hospital as as much when you have the VNS place or these other devices. So they really can improve your quality of life quite a bit. Next slide. And this is just a list of the complications, uh, mainly related to um, hoarseness uh, and uh, uh, kind of infection related things. But again, it's a, it's a relatively safe procedure. Uh, next slide. So the, the last comment I'll make, I'm just gonna do uh, one slide on laser ablation. Next slide. Uh, so laser ablation, if you can see, uh, Lisa, could you uh, show the probe uh, so on the left, just going right to that spot. So that's what the laser uh, uh, laser is. It's a probe that goes into the brain. And so it will uh, use heat to heat up the area that you want to uh, kind of like, it's kind of like the, you know how the surgeon will do, remove a piece of brain tissue. Uh, this actually is a probe, which will just burn the brain and get rid of seizures that way. Could you, uh, could you look on the right hand? Uh, slide and just that yellow area. That's the area that the that the laser ablation has has ablated. Uh, and so the the laser ablation is promising. It seems to be uh, very well tolerated by patients. And again, it's easier than having the surgeon remove a piece of your skull uh, for these bigger surgeries. It's kind of a, a more a less invasive way uh, to get the job done. So why don't I do this? Uh, I think what I'll do is, in the interest of time, uh, just go to uh, let's go next slide. We'll just go to the next couple. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And I'll just uh, end with my conclusions. Epilepsy surgery can make a dramatic difference in a patient's quality of life. The, uh, all these new surgical options are opening opening things up wide open for patients. Uh, if you've tried two or more seizure medications, think about being evaluated for epilepsy surgery. Uh, if you're not, if your seizure is not controlled, really think about that. Uh, and finally, I'll just say epilepsy surgery is not last resort. All right, Lisa, I'm cutting myself off, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll tackle some questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. White. I appreciate you sharing with us. I'm going to quickly um, share a couple slides and we'll do some Q&A here. So wanting to mention that um, at the Epilepsy Foundation, we do have free one-on-one -on -one support available and customized tools and resources on a variety of topics related to epilepsy. And so feel free to reach out to us anytime if you have any questions or wanting to connect with us at the Epilepsy Foundation. And then um, you can see our mission statement here and our contact information. And um, yeah, we invite you to be um, connected with us here at the EFMN. And I'm going to do um, a poll question and then we're going to jump into some Q&A here. And so um, if you would look for your poll, I'm going to launch the last one. And so um, on a scale of one to five with five being the greatest, how much has your understanding of surgery as a treatment option for epilepsy increased tonight. We want to hear um, what you're feeling and, you know, maybe you came here already knowing a few things, so you might have already been well versed at some of this. So we understand that people have different, um, you know, experiences that they come here with. So we hope that everybody um, feels like they learned something new today. So thank you for sharing. It looks like everybody is feeling pretty confident that they learned something new here today. Awesome. Great to have your responses and Hopefully this will help you then as you're in discussions with your doctors, that you will have some more information that help you be more informed about these big decisions that people make regarding treatment options. Um, so wonderful, I'll give you just another moment here to respond before I end the poll. All right, we have almost full participation, so I'm gonna go ahead and end. 
And you can see that across the board, everybody learned something new here today. And so thank you so much for sharing um, that with us. And then I do want to open it up right now for some Q&A. And again, if you um, haven't found that Q&A feature, it's up on the top. Um, I do have one question that we're going to answer right away. And then while I'm, I'm, we're addressing the first couple of questions, if you have other questions that you think of, feel free to type them in. Um, so one of the questions, Dr. White, is would it be very difficult to pinpoint the seizure origin without an MRI or MSI. And um, so a patient who has had like a cochlear implant where a magnet can't be re removed. Um, so yeah, can you answer that in specific to the, you know, correlation with, you know, something like a cochlear implant and um, how they might pinpoint their seizure origin? Yeah, the, uh, so usually, uh, you know, CAT scans can be done and certainly uh, things can be done. It, it, the MRI is probably the one that is the biggest challenge. Uh, but I think what you do is you you work with the tools that you have. So you you, you go with CAT scan uh, or other whatever technology you can do to do the best job that you can do, and and then you you come up with the the best option. And so sometimes because of the limitations of not having an MRI scan, you may have to go with something that may not be uh, in the brain necessarily uh, 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 surgery. Uh, it, may, it may well be, it turned out to be something like, um, uh, you know, the vagus nerve stimulator. But I think the thing to do is to get evaluated and, and see what the options would be. And certainly always we have to tailor the evaluation to the patient uh, because sometimes patients don't tolerate certain parts of our evaluation and for various reasons. They may have medical issues. They may have other reasons that they just can't go through with it. So we just do the best we can with the patient and tailor the, the workup to the patient and the best uh, come up with the best surgical options possible. Great question. All right. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and go to the next question. And so we have a parent sharing that they would like a second opinion on brain surgery options for their son. They've been struggling with controlling his seizures for years. So what would you say to a parent who's, you know, in that position, they're really struggling and um, trying to figure out what their best options are? So I think, I think the, the general advice I would give is uh, second opinions are, are often a very good idea because I know that if, 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 if a patient is feeling like they're just not making progress, getting a fresh set of eyes can be a, a good thing. So sometimes it's when you're someone who is a neurologist and you think that's going to a comprehensive epilepsy center uh, would be beneficial, that can be very valuable. Sometimes it's when you're already at a comprehensive epilepsy center and you wanna go to another one for another opinion. I do think if you're looking for a, uh, a a second opinion in somebody who has complicated seizures, have, have tried multiple seizure medications, my main recommendation would be that you go to a comprehensive uh, epilepsy program to get that comprehensive evaluation. That way you really get the best, uh, uh, best advice. Wonderful, thank you. We have another question and it is, if somebody has scarring on their hippocampus on both sides, um, more on um, maybe on the left, um, would it laser ablation be a consideration for someone um, in that situation with scarring in their hippocampus? Possibly. It's a little bit uh, concerning because if you're going to do surgery on one temporal lobe, you have to make sure the other temporal lobe can support memory function. And so I would say that uh, while it's possible, it's something that is, is uh, it just has to be considered very carefully. So I'd, I'd say a lot of times it, it depends on some of the details on exactly uh, which parts of the brain are going to be removed. I, I would say most of the time, there's just too much concern that if they're scarring in both hippocampi, that the, the risk of, of memory decline uh, is too much. So I, I won't rule it out completely, but I would be very cautious. Thank you for your answer. 
We have another question. Um, as a practical matter, when is a patient too old for surgery? So is there an age limit? People might wonder, um, does this have to be done by a certain age? Can you speak to that? Well, the I, I can only say that the age that surgeries are being done successfully is increasing. So as the population ages, and also there's more healthy people in their 50s, 60s, and beyond that epilepsy surgery is being offered. So there's two, two things to consider. So one is the age, but also the health of the person. Because I think we all know some people who are in their 50s, 60s, and beyond who are kind of like, you know, much younger, you know, they're very, very, they're very strong and, uh, uh, you know, good and very good health. Uh, and that, that can, that can lead to successful surgery in somebody who, who, who can look at it. So age is, uh, the way I would look at it is age is only one factor to consider. The other factor is the overall health. And I don't think there's a, uh, a clear number that has been set as to what's, uh, you know, quote, too old for epilepsy surgery, because uh, there's so many other, so many other factors. One thing's for sure, though, the the age that these surgeries are being done successfully is much older than they used to be, and that's because surgery is becoming safer, uh, and patients who are uh, older are better able to tolerate it. Wonderful, thanks. We have another question. And the question is, why does a wire need to go so far into the brain for RNS? I thought the probes were going to be on the brain surface. So can you elaborate on the RNS surgery and the wires? And Absolutely. Based? Absolutely. This, this, is a, this is a great question. The, the, uh, the RNS is tailored to where the patient's seizures are coming from. So the, some people will have their electrodes only on the surface. And be, because that's where their seizures are coming from, the, the reason they're put deeper is when the seizure focus is considered to come deeper, deeper in the brain. And I, and I have to say, that's not an uncommon thing where those probes have to go to a depth because a lot of times the seizures are coming from deeper in the brain uh, than just on the surface. But great question. Wonderful. So that concludes our questions and we're just a couple minutes over seven. So thank you for everyone who's able to stay on for just a couple minutes. Um, later, I want to thank Dr. White for being here tonight and sharing his time and his expertise and thank you all for being here. It's been wonderful and I appreciate everybody's participation. I know um, that it is really important information. Um, yeah, and then um, one of the things, I had one other question that just came up that I'll quickly address as we're saying goodbye here is how we can, um, how can someone connect with um, you and your staff about surgery options? So if he's been seen, you know, before like at Minnesota Epilepsy Group and he's done testing like the PET scan, um, you know, the, the MEG, the MRI, the CAT scans, and now trying keto, but haven't seen any positive outcomes, mm -hmm. what, what would you suggest we would, you know, they want to do more monitoring, to watch his seizure activity. Um, what would you suggest to someone who's already gone through all those steps and has exhausted some of their options? What what would you recommend they would do at that point? Oh, really? This is this is an uh, incredible question. Really great question. So uh, go back for another. Uh, I start start with just a clinic visit and see whether the timing is right uh, to uh, pursue to. Uh, do more testing uh, if needed, and just see what your options are. Time changes. Uh, there, there can be a time where, you know, what was possible or not, I should say, what was not possible a few years ago is now becoming more possible. And so I think, uh, um, I think it's really important uh, that people get that updated review because there's so many advances, even, even as the years go by, uh, just the advances are incredible. So I think it would be helpful just to go back, um, see how things, you know, what has changed? Is there any, is there any more options for you? And it doesn't hurt to just do a, uh, you know, one-time visit. You can do a in, in-person uh, clinic visit, or you can do a, you know, a telemed visit. And, you know, here, we didn't talk much about COVID here, but, you know, the, the COVID, you have to kind of work with what the options are. Thanks for that question. Thanks.
Yeah, absolutely. And again, just thank you so much, Dr. White, and all of you for being here tonight. I hope that this helped you all. And again, feel free to reach out to the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota anytime. We're glad to be a resource to you. And um, yeah, you have really, um, really appreciate everybody's participation and this information that you shared tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and we look forward to connecting with you again. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks. Thank you.